What is strike and dip and how do I take these readings using a Brunton compass? According to the principle of original horizontality, sedimentary rocks are buried in horizontal beds or layers. When these beds or layers are exposed and tilted up and found in contorted orientations, then the geologist uses strike and dip to measure the extent of these deformations so that they can be mapped and thus interpreted. So let's have a look at strike first. Strike is the compass direction of a line on a bedding plane as that plane intersects with an imaginary horizontal surface. We use an imaginary horizontal surface because not all bedding planes intersect perfectly flat ground. Often the tilted bedding plane might intersect the ground partway up a mountain or might be covered over with sedimentary debris. This means the geologist is not able to get an accurate strike. So the geologist must imagine a surface that is perfectly horizontal with the ground. Let me demonstrate this by using a bucket filled with water where the water represents our imaginary surface. So here we've got a piece of slate. It's sitting in a tub of water. Remember, any strike line has to be perfectly parallel with the surface of the earth. And since there's lots of rocks and all kinds of encumbrances at the bottom of most inclined bedding planes, it's not always easy to find an exactly straight orientation. So that's our imaginary horizontal level. And so we can easily take strike on that because we can see it. If, however, you're out in the field and you don't have a nice bucket of water that you can put at the bottom of your slope, you can actually take some water and pour it down your slope, as I've done in a previous example. And you can see that the line that the water makes with the horizontal imaginary surface of water is completely perpendicular. Notice that that line is perpendicular to the imaginary surface, or what is actually water in our bucket. So we now know what our strike line has to be, even if we were in the field, because we could just use our watery example. So we take our trusty Brunton compass, and remember it has to be flat, and so you'll want to use your level, your bullet level inside your Brunton compass. Make sure it's perfectly flat, and you point the Brunton in the direction of that strike line. Once you've pointed the Brunton in the direction of that strike line, press the little white button on your Brunton to keep everything still, and then you can go ahead and read your Brunton. And you'll notice that in this example, we're being told that strike is about 25 degrees west of north. Now notice when you look at your Brunton compass, you'll see that there is an east and there is a west on this side. However, on a regular compass, this is east and this is west. Don't get confused. The east and west symbols on a Brunton are switched to better represent reality. After all, on a regular compass, this side is east, but the compass bearing is definitely to the west. So we would read this north 25 degrees west, or 25 degrees west of north. And in fact, if we look at our strike line, and it's going generally in that direction, and if that is north, then that's about right. It's about 25 degrees west of north. Okay, so what about dip? Well, when you're taking dip, again, you want to be able to make sure that your trusty Brunton compass is pointing completely and perfectly down the steepest part of your slope or your incline. One of the best ways to do that is to get some trusty water again and have the water just flow down your slope. And when you do that, you can see that that is the steepest path for the water to take. That is also perpendicular to strike. And that is exactly the surface that you want to measure. So put your Brunton compass on its side with the clinometer to the bottom. And then on the back of your Brunton compass, there's a lever. And you turn that lever until your level is nice in between the lines. And you can see right there, the bubble is almost between the lines. OK, so right between the lines now. And now what you need to do is look at your compass at the clinometer and you can see 
that we're given a dip there of about 36 degrees. Easy as that. The other thing we want to know is the direction of dip. So in this example, this particular bedding plane is dipping towards the east. Okay, so now that we know how to take strike and dip, let's figure out how to write it. In the example we just observed, our strike was 25 degrees west of north, and our dip was 35 degrees to the east. Now this is written N25W slash 35E, or 25 degrees west of north and 35 degrees east. Now, some of you may be using an azimuth compass where you are simply reading the bearing in degrees. In this case, you would just take 25 degrees from 360 degrees, and it would be written as 335 slash 35E. Okay, so let's test your comprehension here. Can you tell me approximately what the strike and dip are in this example, keeping in mind that north is straight ahead, east is to the right, and west is to the left? Pause the video until you've found an answer, and don't forget to write out each answer in its correct format before you press play. Okay, now do the same with this example. And this one. Okay, so let's see how well you fared. In the first example, you'll notice that the strike direction is a little to the right, which is east. It turned out to be 25 degrees east of north, and the dip is about 30 to 35 degrees or so, and dipping to the southeast. And this is written as N25E, or 25 degrees east of north, and 35 southeast. Now, did you get that right? If you did, then great job. Translating that over to azimuth is easy and is written as 25 slash 35 SE. In the second example, the strike was to the left, and by the way, it could have been to the right. I am simply choosing to measure strike to the west, which is left. And since straight ahead is north, that would make it about 90 degrees to the west. Now, just as a reminder, don't get confused with the location of the east and west symbols on a Brunton compass. So reading it directly from the compass would be 90 degrees west of north. So what about the dip? Well, it's pretty obvious that in this example, the slate is vertical, which means our dip will be 90 degrees to the south. This is written W slash 90 S, and in the azimuth, you would just take 90 degrees from 360, which gives you 270 degrees and is written 270 slash 90 S. The final example should have been a little easier. And that's because the strike is pointing straight ahead or to the north. The dip looks a bit lower than some of the other examples. And so if you set about 20 degrees to the east, you'd be correct. And this is written as N slash 20 east in the quadrant system and as 0 slash 20 east in the azimuth system. Now, if you got all of those correct, well then congratulations, you're doing a great job. Okay, so it's time now for our spotlight on creationism. So as a Christian, I believe that the earth experienced a massive worldwide catastrophe that we call Noah's flood. But how much of the rock record was actually deposited in that event? In other words, which rocks belong to the flood of Noah and which rocks don't? Well, most creationists actually believe that only rocks belonging to the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic eras are representative of those deposited during Noah's flood. But there are varying minority positions, including some that believe almost the entire geologic column was deposited in Noah's flood. There are also a multitude of marginal positions that restrict flood rocks to smaller portions of the geologic column. To get my perspective on this question, please go to the link in the description, which will take you to the first of a three-part series. So what are creationists to make of this disparity in opinions? Well, the first thing to remember is that none of these models are found in scripture. It is true that the Bible categorically states that the flood of Noah was global and catastrophic, but that is all it states. This means that although creationist flood models must include global and catastrophic components, the models themselves are not on par with scripture. Yet you would be surprised to learn just how many creationists treat their particular scientific model 
as though it was scripturally authoritative. Yet this is a dangerous practice because it means scriptural truth become tightly linked to scientific opinions. So next time you're prone to say to someone, oh, these rocks are for sure flood rocks, because maybe you saw it on some creationist website, think again, because that might not actually be the case. Okay, so that's all from me here, Dr. C at Creation Geology for Beginners. Now, don't forget, I've got more resources. There's a website, www.creationunfolding.com. There's a book if you're interested in that as well. If you thought this video was helpful, then please go ahead and hit that like button and subscribe for easier access to more videos later. Ring the bell while you're there as well. All right, so that's all from me. Good luck, and we'll see you next time.